Well, good morning, everyone. So great to see you today. If you are our guest, thanks so much for joining us at Fellowship Greenville. If you haven't yet, I wanna invite you to stop by guest services out in the commons area after the service. Uh, we have some friendly folks there who would love to meet you, answer any questions you might have about our church family. I would like to also invite all of you who have yet to attend a little something we like to call Starting Point to come and join us for, for a Starting Point. We have one next Sunday morning. It begins at 1030. It goes till about 12 o'clock. It's an opportunity for us to meet you and for you to learn more about fellowship I'll be there, Rob Marks, our executive pastor, will be there, Jim Thompson, our care and equipping pastor, will be there, Zach Rigsby, our discipleship pastor, will be there, Josh Amos, our connection, there's gonna be a lot of us there. And so we would love for you to join us. You can sign up using the QR code seat in front of you, or you can go to our website and you can sign up there, but we would love to have you join us if you've never been to a starting point before. And when a new year kicks off, there are always plenty of opportunities to jump into some intentional and gospel-centered ministries around here. And our new updated FG News, hot off the presses as of last week, but I think we also ran out, so glad you could get some more. Uh, redesigned, reformatted. Let you know a lot of the great things that we have going on here. There is a ministry in particular that I would like to take just a moment and highlight. It just so happens that it coincides with the gospel transformation story that we talk which we always do inside of FG News. We love to tell a gospel transformation story of Will and Heather. And so uh, it is a wonderful ministry called Reengage. And uh, there you go. Pastor Mike came in just for that. Thanks, Mike. You can leave now. You're already here for the first service. Um, if you're interested in being a part of Reengage, we cannot recommend it highly enough. Like it is a wonderful ministry. So many of you have been a part of it. If you want to grow in your marriage, work on your marriage, it starts this coming week, and so go ahead and get signed up. Again, QR code in front of you online. You can stop out in the commons at Next Steps. They'll be happy to get you signed up as well. Uh, this is a little bit embarrassing. I don't know that I've ever done it before in all my time, but I've walked up on the stage still wearing my jacket, and I've lost between four and seven pounds in the four minutes that I've been standing up here because it's very, very hot. So if you don't mind, let me take my jacket off. I need to let all the camera people know in the back because they don't think I'm just walking away and we're done with the sermon or that you guys think we're done. We're just like, yes, but we're not. I haven't even gotten to the Bible yet. So just give me a hot minute here. Take this off. <clears throat> Literally a hot minute, if you know what I mean. Okay, here we go. Super, okay, great. All right. Okay. That's right, it's good, it's great. I don't even know how much this t-shirt cost, but it was worth the laughs. And honestly, to get our point across, because even though we've been saying, if you ever wanna be discouraged as a pastor, just be a pastor. And what I mean by that, you can just say the same thing over and over again, and Charlie and Karen still have people coming up to him, like, where are you guys headed for retirement? He's not going anywhere, people. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that today. We are in a season of uh, what I call a uh, minimal transition. And I wanna explain that as uh, Lord willing, Charlie steps back from the directional pastor role and I officially step into that role. Uh, Charlie uh, shared more about this and the process last week. He said a lot of uh, kind and gracious things. And uh, I'd like to take a moment and say a few things myself. And the first is that Charlie is not retiring. And for that, I'm incredibly thankful. And I know you are as well. Uh, I shared more about this with Matt on our quarterly church update podcast that we do here. And uh, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but one of the things I talked about on the podcast is I think it's helpful for us as we look at where we're headed to understand where we've been. When Charlie came on staff in the mid 1990s, his official title was and has continued to be teaching pastor slash directional leader. It pops up on the screen every uh, time that he teaches here. That's what it says, teaching pastor slash directional leader. And the invitation from the elders for me to come on the team a couple of years ago was that I would eventually step into the directional part of that title. And so if affirmed by the members here, I would be the directional pastor and Charlie would continue on as teaching pastor. And yes, Jim Thompson and I would continue to be a part of the teaching team. And as many of you know, 
Uh, others of our pastors here at FG teach from time to time as well. So when it comes to uh, books of the Bible that we're walking through, Charlie has and will continue to give thought to all of that. I will continue to give thought to directional things in conjunction with the elders. And yes, Charlie did mention it last week, but if you weren't here, he'll continue to be an elder as well. What he didn't talk about, because Charlie doesn't talk a lot about himself, is uh, Charlie's also gonna be spending some time coaching up and encouraging a lot of other pastors, including the pastors who are joining us as a part of the Upstate Church Collective. Uh, you may or may not know this, but Charlie's doctorate, he's Dr. Charles Boyd, uh, Charlie's doctorate is in teaching guys to teach the Bible. Like that's what he has done for a really long time. Again, he doesn't talk about himself, so I'll get to talk about him. Um, also, I got you one of these t-shirts, don't worry about it. Yours says, I'm not retiring. Anyway, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, uh, Charlie has done this for, he, he coaches guys around the nation, like who send in sermons and he works with them. That's a part of my own story here at Fellowship from years gone by. When I was here as a student ministry pastor, uh, a long, long time ago, I remember, I'd been here for a couple years, and I reached out to Charlie via email, and I said, hey, because I have so much respect for how he teaches the Bible, I said, hey, would you be interested in teaching me how you teach the Bible? To which Charlie wrote back, and again, proving the point that he doesn't talk about himself, well, you know that's what my doctorate is in, even though you've worked here for like five years, kid. And I was like, no, I had no idea. And so it was really kind and gracious of him. He said, record uh, your next message that you do in high school. And so I took a cassette tape, uh, for those of you that don't know, back in the day, there were these things. <laughs> I hear they're making a comeback. I don't want this younger generation to think you've discovered something. They've been around, all right? Anyway, I gave him a cassette tape and an outline that was, I'm sure, pretty rough. And he was kind and gracious and began to meet with me and coach me up in teaching the Bible. And he does that for a lot of different people. And so as we plant churches and as other people step into the residency of the Upstate Church Collective, part of how Charlie will be spending his time is also coaching those guys up. And I'm incredibly thankful for that. Side note, the older I get, the more thankful I am for guys that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that still love Jesus or following Jesus and modeling what that looks like. And his investment in anybody that he has the opportunity to invest in is time well spent. So he'll be quite busy and I'm glad he's still gonna be around. I love you. All right, there you go, I wanted to say that. <clears throat> Interdependency and plurality of leadership within the local church is biblical and it's beautiful and it's necessary. Uh, and as Charlie mentioned last week, because of the interdependency and the plurality here, I'm not sure many of you or even our team here notice as much of a difference in the day in and day out of church life of Fellowship Greenville, especially in how we've been operating for the past 30 months or so. But I do think uh, that we'll be able to benefit from each of us continuing to swing from our sweet spot of ministry as we look to continue to multiply ministry. So thanks for giving me a chance to speak to that. I am also supposed to say, and it sounds a little weird for me, if you are in a, well, no matter whether you affirm or don't affirm, if you're a member here, there's the opportunity for you to do one or the other. You can do that online. You can stop by Next Steps. I believe that they have some affirmation forms there and you can stop by there today. That has one more week. We do that for one more week and then so on and so forth. So I'm excited to uh, pick up in our royalty series as we continue our study through 1 Samuel. Charlie kicked us off last week. Again, if you missed it, uh, because of travel or sickness or whatever, go back and give it a listen online because it so well sets up where we have been in the study and where we will be moving forward. If you have your copy of the scriptures, I wanna invite you to go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, and that's where we will be this morning. As you turn there, let me kick off our time by asking you a question before we jump into our text. This is the question. And you don't have to answer it out loud, just think about it. The question is, how courageous are you? How courageous are you? Uh, courage is the mental or moral strength to persevere and withstand danger, fear, difficulty. Maybe it'd be helpful to think about it kind of like on a, on a scale, on a scale of one to 10. 10 being, I would run into the burning building if someone were inside, no questions asked. One being, I would walk the other direction from the burning building. Maybe I would make a phone call. 
Five being depends on who's in the building. <laughs> right? Like, I don't want to give it away if you haven't watched it yet, but this whole This Is Us thing, this show that was on a long time ago, right? He went back in because the dog was in the house and then, you know, he's not with us anymore. And so I would just, like for me, I mean, I've got daughters, but I would just look at them and go, Phew, let's just get you another dog. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't send an email. I know you love your pets. They're phenomenal. Did I lose some affirmations? I lost some affirmations. Anyway, <laughs> it was a gamble. I wrote it down, might lose affirmations. And then I put, make joke anyway. It's who you are. Just be you. Stories of courage are so captivating and inspiring, aren't they? From movies where courage is exemplified to real life stories of people who rise up and overcome their fears and do courageous things to movies about real life courage, which are a lot of times my favorite, these stories draw us in. When tragedy occurs, in the midst of that tragedy, we begin to hear stories of courage. And if you're anything like me, you stop and wonder, what would I do if that were me in that moment? In the aftermath of 9-11, such tragedy and then story after story began to come out of people who showed incredible courage. Whether first responders or others who just ran towards the danger, story after story of people going into buildings that were anything but safe. To Todd Beamer and others who on that dark day in our history rushed hijackers to take down a plane that was on its way to inflict even more death and destruction. Courage. For me, with this thought, how would I respond if that were me? When I was a kid, one of my favorite shows was uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I like to watch it, watch it all the time. And as many of you would probably know, Mr. Rogers is quite well known for this quote. When I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Why is courage necessary? Why the need to look for helpers? Why are there so many inspirational courage quotes on our social media feeds? Why are so many Christian songs on Christian radio all about courage, fear? Well, it's because we live in a fearful world. And listen, it's not just fear in regards to national tragedy or even major life-altering singular moments in time. It's the day in, day out of our lives. For some of you this morning, you have this wrestle in regards to courage in the midst of fear. And you even walk in today wondering, will I keep my job? Can I pay the bills? Can I live up to the expectation of others? Can I live up to my own expectations? Will my marriage get any better? Will my kids walk with Jesus? Will they come back and walk with Jesus? Will this physical sickness or ailment always be with me? Will I be able to own up to my shortcomings or be able to admit my struggle to anyone? Will I be able to stand up to my fill in the blank, whoever it is you're doing life with that is being unkind or unethical? Will I ever have the courage to share my faith with those that I love, do life with? Will I follow where I know God is leading no matter where God is leading? And then times a hundred other questions running through for some of you, your minds today. Courage and fear, it's relatable because it's life, always has been. And we're gonna see that this morning as we study 1 Samuel 17. But before we do jump into that passage, let me remind you of a few things that I've reminded us of before when we're walking through stories of the Old Testament. And the primary thing I want to remind you of today is this. If you're a note taker, jot it down. Come back to it time and time again when you're reading your Bible. You are not the character of the story that is being taught and talked about. You are not the character of the story that is being taught and talked about. Here's what I mean. Some of you grew up hearing pastors talk about passages we're in, even the passage we're in today. 
about how you're David and your life is full of Goliaths and you need to pick up your smooth stones and slay the Goliaths of your life. Or another famous example, you are Ruth, ladies, and you just need to wait on your Boaz. He's right around the corner, maybe. Or you're Moses, and this is how you make the Red Sea of your life, whatever your Red Sea is, figuratively part. And I like to be one of the guys that is a pastor in your life now that gets to look at you on the regular and say, I'm really sorry if that's how you heard the Old Testament talked about. When you're studying through the Bible, here's what you're really looking for. Any book of the Bible. You should be looking, I should be looking, to be reminded of who God is. That's it. You're looking to be reminded of who God is. What does this tell me about God? Now you're also gonna be reminded of what's wrong with the world. You're gonna be reminded of the human condition, which is so relatable because you're a human and so am I. And we're gonna be reminded and encouraged by what God was and is doing about all of it in and through Jesus. So uh, when Charlie, let's say, points out the idolatry of the children of Israel, we get that. That resonates with us because we too struggle with idolatry of the heart. Or let's say Jim's talking about how at times there's frustration in our wrestling with faith and dependence upon God and we see that in the scriptures from other people. We relate to that because we've been there. And even when we come to the passage today, We're getting ready to read about how the Israelites were immobilized by their fear. Yet someone was courageous on their behalf. And that's gonna resonate with us too. Because true courage in the midst of fearful times is found in the true hero of our story. And that hero is not us. True courage is found in the true hero of our story. So here's what I want you to do. You bow your heads, close your eyes. And one of the reasons that I'm doing uh, a little prayer time here on the front end this morning, just to let you know, is because we're coming to a passage that for some of us in the room, we've heard a lot, the story of David and Goliath. For some of you in the room, it's not a new story. The longer I pastor, the more I realize in God's kindness and grace, there are people that are joining us that actually haven't heard David and Goliath talked about. So what a great opportunity. Would you take a moment, no matter how often you've heard David versus Goliath, and ask the Spirit of God to speak to you through the Word of God to remind you of who God is. Spirit of God, speak to us through the word of God today. Amen. So let me pick up the story. I kind of want to do it. Charlie did such a great job of this last week. It's a whole lot of text. And so uh, what I'm going to do today is very similar. I'm just going to kind of read through it. I'll stop and make a few observations along the way, and then we'll apply it uh, on the back end of our time together this morning. And I'm not going to read all of chapter 17. You can go back and do that this week, but I'm going to read a lot of it, but I'm going to pick up in verse four. Does that sound good? Here we go. First Samuel 17 verse four says this, then Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet. His bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. He also had an armor bearer who walked ahead of him carrying a shield. We'll stop right there. 
<clears throat> Let me address this really quickly if I could. This week I was off site studying and writing some stuff and it was kind of later in the week to be honest with you in regards to trying to put something together when I had this idea about, oh man, I wonder if we have anything laying around the church that's somewhere between nine and a half and 10 feet tall. And so my good buddy Scott, who sets up our stage and does such a great job changing stuff up all the time, I called Scott and I go, hey, we got anything between nine and a half and 10 feet tall? He said, yeah, no problem. I said, let's make it a giant. And so I present to you for today and today only uh, Goliath who will now be rolled out carefully because we don't need this going into the crowd. There we go, let's roll him out here. We put a face, it's good. Thanks, you're doing great. Odd two, you're gonna get to see him in just a minute, don't worry about it. Uh, the camera shot will be able to, there you go, put him right there. There he is. That's also Scott's helmet that he wears when he's walking up around the catwalk so he doesn't crack his head. So here's our uh, Goliath right here. This is about 10 feet, to be honest with you. This is about 10 feet right here. Right? He's gonna stay out here with me today as we, uh, as we teach and as we talk. There have been some uh, more recent archeological discoveries at the site of ancient Gath that lets us know that during this time period, there was someone named Goliath talked about amongst the Philistines. And yes, there is some debate on exactly how tall Goliath was, and I'm so excited that I get to be the one today to clear that up by saying definitively, he was really tall. <laughs> taller than you, taller than me, tall enough to scare you to death if you had to battle, battle him. And his armor, we read right here, weighed 125 pounds. That is the size of some of you wrapped around his neck, just hanging out getting ready to go to battle. And then for fun, he had a spear where the tip of the spear was 15-ish pounds and someone carried his shield. So he was a fairly confident fellow. He seemed to have some good things going for him as far as warrior giants go. I'm sure he had some knee issues because he's tall. <laughs> he's carrying around all of that weight. That's speculation on my part. That was not in a commentary anywhere. How do I know that he was quite confident because of what he said? He was quite braggadocious. Look at verse eight. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then he will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy, verse 10 says, the armies of Israel today, send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Now, before we talk about this, history matters a bit, because this is not the first time, historically, that the children of Israel have faced some giants. Some of you might remember that after God rescued the children of Israel from the Egyptians and being slaves, they went to the edge of Canaan, the promised land. And there you can read about this in Numbers 13 is where you can pick up the story, but here's a quick synopsis for you. Moses sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan to do a little recon mission. And 10 of the 12 spies came back and said this, this is Numbers 13. Verse 31, we can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we travel through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers and that's what they thought too. Now, as the story goes, the other two spies, a guy named Caleb and a guy named Joshua, they didn't agree with the other 10. Their response was, let's go. The Lord will give us the land. It's been promised. But the people were terrified of the giants and they didn't move forward. And as a result, if you know the story, it's gonna be 40 years of all of them with the exception of Caleb and Joshua wandering and then dying, not in the promised land, but in the wilderness. I say that to say this, with the children of Israel, there is giant history. And if you come to this part of the journey for the children of Israel, it's interesting to me that it's not 40 years, but we do read down in verse 16, maybe symbolic. First Samuel 17, 16 says, for 40 
days. Every morning and evening, the Philistine champions strutted in front of the Israelite army. Braggadocious, taunting. It's also interesting that Saul was described earlier back in chapter nine of 1 Samuel, interestingly enough, as taller than everyone else as he was chosen to be king. Yet it says here in verse 11 that he was terrified and deeply shaken as God has now, as we looked at last week, rejected him as king. But it's not all hopeless because there's this guy who goes by the name David who seems to think very similarly to the guys from back in the day by the name of Caleb and Joshua. Big giants, not a problem for our bigger God. Now notice, and I think this is important, back in verse eight of chapter 17, Goliath's offer in regards to this battle, this fight, was this. Israel, you pick a guy, and then I'll be the guy for the Philistines, and it's a winner take all fight to the death. I kill your guy, you become our slaves. Your guy kills me, we become your slaves. That's the offer, that's the deal. That's the taunt, that's the come on, let's get this on. And I don't have time to walk through all of it today, verse by verse, but if you keep, re keep reading here in chapter 17, you're gonna see that David, who had been anointed by Samuel to be the future king, was splitting time between serving the current king, Saul, and taking care of things back home by being a shepherd. And as Charlie mentioned last week, David's dad, Jesse, actually had eight sons and his three oldest boys, they're already out with this army and everything with Israel and everything that's going on with the Philistines and Goliath. And so Jesse sends David to take some food to his brothers. Look with me, if you would, in verse 20. This is what it says. <clears throat> so David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelites' army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. All right, here we go. Pump ourselves up. Verse 21, and soon the Israelites and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. Verse 22 says, David left his things with the keeper of supplies and he hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks and then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. Verse 24 as soon as the Israelites' army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant, the men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king, however, has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. The Bible's great, isn't it? Let's stop here very briefly. How do you like that for a reward? Some of you single guys are going, I don't know, maybe, yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or if you have a pretty large tax bill, it's kind of a win-win, as I was thinking about it. Either I win and I don't have to pay my taxes, or he kills me and I don't have to pay my taxes. <laughs> David gets wind of the deal and the offer. And again, you can read this this week. There's a little interaction between him and one of his brothers, but basically his brother accuses David of being in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong motives. But let's pick up the story in verse 32. David says, uh, <clears throat> don't worry about the Philistine. He said that to Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. He's been a man of war since his youth. Verse 34, but David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. So David's like, let's go, I'm in. I'm gonna go fight Goliath. And Saul says, no way, you're tiny. He's gonna crush you. 
And then David says, well, listen to my fighting resume, which includes fighting a lion and a bear, which in fairness is a pretty good fighting resume. It's better than yours, and it's definitely better than mine. There was this one kid in first grade, but that's about all I got. It must have been somewhat convincing if you look back in verse 37. It says, Saul finally consented and said, all right, and may the Lord be with you. Again, I'm not trying to make just a ton of jokes, but if you don't have a great sense of humor as you read through, the Bible has a great sense of humor. But I, I actually, I wrote in my notes, is this the inspiration for the princess bride? Have fun storming the castle. Do you think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Like that's what I wrote, like this interaction between David and Saul. I think that's how it played out. Verse 38, Saul gives David his own armor a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, he strapped on the sword over it. He took a step or two to see what it was like because he had never worn such things before. And then he says, I can't go in these things. He protested to Saul, I'm not used to him. Not only is he not used to him, I've already told you that Saul's a pretty tall guy. He's not Goliath tall, but he's a really tall dude. And David's not that big. So it says that David took them off again. Verse 40 says, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and he put them into a shepherd's bag. And then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Verse 41. (laughs) Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. Verse 43. Am I a dog? He roared at David. That you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I will give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. Let me take a minute here and address what has continued to happen throughout this chapter. Goliath has continuously spoken in a way that dishonors God mocked him, defied him, derided him, Yahweh and the children of Israel. Go back to verse 26. I didn't, I didn't read through it the first time around. Here it is. David says, <clears throat> he asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Look at this. Who is this pagan Philistine anyway? that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God. It's not lost on me that these are actually the first words we have David speaking as captured by the author. Like up to this point, he's been in the story, but he hasn't said anything. And the first things we have recorded that he's saying, I believe tells us a little bit about his worldview. And his worldview would be this. There is a living God. And if there is a living God, that makes all the difference no matter what's going on in life. And the mocking of God and the defying of God, what did it do? It stood out to him. It captured his attention. It actually moved him towards action. Was it simply that he might get to marry a lady and not have to pay his taxes? No, no, no. It's that someone was defiling the name of God. I've asked myself this question as I've studied this week and in times past in my life, how sensitive am I to how people speak about my God? Does it stand out to me? Do you notice when people take the name of the Lord God in vain? Does it resonate with you at all? Do you hear it in the show that you're watching? The music that you're listening to? It's not the point of my message today. It was just a little thinking that I was doing because Goliath was running his mouth and what Goliath was running his mouth about had everything to do about David's God. Verse 45, David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. There it is. 
Verse 46 says, today the Lord will conquer you and I'm gonna kill you and I'm gonna cut off your head. And then I'm gonna give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. And as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Verse 49, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. This is an incredible scene. The stones that David had picked up would have been roughly the size of a tennis ball. And because they were smooth, they would have flown a bit straighter than jagged rocks and the speed would have reached 100 miles an hour or more. So he put a fastball right into the forehead of Goliath and dropped him. Verse 50 for good measure. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone for he had no sword. Then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. And there you have it. The story of David versus Goliath, which as I was studying this week led me to this question. So what? Simply a cool story? A metaphor for life is hard, so grab your slingshot and your five stones and get ready for battle. Your five stones of prayer and faith and devotions. And I gotta come up with two other stones that I can't think of right now. A great example for us when we face the giants of life. What does it tell us about God? It tells us what David said, that there is a living God and if there is a living God, that ma actually makes all the difference. And the difference is not found in an example. The difference is found in a savior and there's a difference between an example and a savior. Like, aren't you so thankful that when you're scared and there's moments that I'm scared, when you're worried, there's moments I'm worried, when you're frightened, there's moments that I'm frightened, when you're anxious, there's moments that I'm anxious. Aren't you so thankful that in those moments you don't simply have an example to help you muster up courage? You've got more than that little quote that people send around social media about courage. You actually have a living God. You actually have a savior. Someone who has won the battle on your behalf because true courage is found in the true hero of our story and it's not us. David is the champion and savior of Israel on this day that we just read about. The children of Israel were the beneficiaries of someone who battled on their behalf. That's, remember, that's what Goliath had challenged David to, a representative battle, like a duel. You represent Israel, I'll represent the Philistines. Winner takes all. What does this story tell us about God? What does it remind us about in regards to Jesus? What does it mean for those of us that are in Christ? Always be asking that when you have your Bible open. It means that we as followers of Jesus have someone who has won the battle on our behalf and to this day intercedes on our behalf. Jesus is not merely your good example. Jesus is your substitute. Jesus is your champion and that makes all the difference no matter what you're facing. If you remember in Hebrews 11, there's this long list of people you read about in the Old Testament. Some refer to them as heroes of the faith. 
And they're there that we might read about them. Abraham, Moses, Noah, Gideon, Samson, Samuel, they're all listed. And yes, David is in that list too. So don't forget about these guys, the author of Hebrews says. But then it says this as he goes into chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Verse two, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, there it is, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Yeah, 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 look at David, read about David. But fix your eyes on Jesus. You're not David. Look at the true champion, the true hero of our story, because that is where true courage is found. So yeah, I'm not trying to minimize. I hope you hear that. And I hope this doesn't come across as like, what's the Bible school answer, uh, Sunday school answer? Jesus. Here's what I'm trying to say. You can talk about your fears. You got them? Great. Me too. Name them. What are they? What are you terrified of losing? What keeps you up at night? In what part of your life do you currently need courage? All I wanna remind you of today is you don't have to stand here today and attempt to slay the giants of your life because in and through Jesus, the giant of all giants, your sin and separation from God has been overcome through the champion, Jesus Christ. If you're in him, that has ramifications for all of life, not just heaven when you die. It changes everything and it changes everything in the here and now and it changes everything for how you face the fearful times of your life that aren't all about you, but Christ in you. I love the term that Paul Tripp uses. He calls it um, identity amnesia. We forget who we are at times, and by that I mean we forget whose we are. Right, I need that reminder all the time. I love coming and worshiping with all of you. The reason I love coming to church on Sunday is because I know without a shadow of a doubt in this place, every time we gather together, I'm gonna be reminded of whose I am. If you're looking to identify with somebody in this story from 1 Samuel 17, I identify most with all the Israelites that are just standing around scared to death. Listen, even though they were soldiers in the army of the most high God, right? Were they not soldiers in the army of the most high God? David shows up and David, I think, does point us to Jesus, the true hero of our story. And this morning, I long for nothing more than to remind those of you who follow Jesus that your fears of this life need not paralyze you because you belong to the most high God. And your courage and my courage is found in the true hero of your story, my story, who has battled on your behalf and given you the victory you would have never attained on your own. That's the good news. And as I studied this week, there was just person after person who goes to this church that was popping into my mind who are facing some really difficult times. In a church this big, I don't know everybody's fear, anxiety, worry. And at the same time, in a church this big, I do actually know a lot of people's. And some of you have been in that season in the past and you would give testimony to what I've talked about today. How Christ has moved on your behalf. Others of you are currently in that season Others of you not to be a doomsday guy, the season's coming because we live in a fallen world. So here's what I wanna do. I did it first service, I'm gonna do it again today, the second service. I wanna invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm gonna pray over you a benediction. Before I do, I'm gonna ask this question of you. We don't do this often here, but I am today. If you are currently in a season of fear, worry, anxiety, 
a need for courage. Maybe you identify with the questions I was rolling through at the beginning of our message today. Maybe what you're facing wasn't mentioned on that list. But because of where things currently are for you or maybe someone super close to you, what we've talked about today definitely resonates. If that's you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, we're just gonna pray over everybody, but I do want you to stand up. If that's you today, go ahead and stand. Thank you. All across the room. Hey, over and odd too, we did this first service as well. Dozens and dozens of people stood there. So feel free to stand if that's you. It's awesome. What I'm praying over you today is really uh, taking a lot of the words from Psalm 18. It's a song of David to the Lord because the Lord has rescued him. More on that story as we keep studying his life. But I just took these words along with some of the words from Paul, the church of Philippi, and I just wanna pray them over you today. So let's pray together. And I invite any of you that are still seated just to extend your hands out in solidarity towards those that are standing because they're standing all over the room. We love you, Lord. You are our strength. Lord, you are our rock. You are our fortress. And you are our savior. In you and you alone, we find protection. For you are our shield, the power that saves us. And you are our place of safety. We call on you, Lord, for you are worthy of praise and you have saved us from our enemy, the one who hates us. You have rescued us and you delight in us. And Father God, your ways are perfect and your promises prove true. You are a shield for all who look to you for protection. Your right hand supports us and you have made a wide path for our feet to keep them from slipping. So we will praise you and we will sing praises to your name because you show unfailing love to us forever. And may we not be anxious about anything, but in everything with thanksgiving, may we present our request to you and may your peace, which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds. In Jesus's sweet, proven, courageous name, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with everyone who's already standing and let's continue to worship together.